All right, so we're going to talk about um, the organism Histoplasma capsulatum. Um, this is one of the fungal infections that um, we are going to discuss as part of infections that often cause pulmonary um, symptoms, although it does have some other manifestations that we'll talk about. Um, this is kind of the first of the fungal infections that we're talking about. We've talked about a lot of different infections that are bacterial, some parasites and some viruses. And now we're gonna start digging into the fungal causes of disease. Okay, so first off, histoplasma is a dimorphic organism. What does that mean? So um, in the notes, there's about five pages where I go into kind of the foundations of mycology. And one of the things with fungi is that they can exist as either a yeast or a mold, okay? So like a mold is like that green patch that you see on your, you know, bread or your cheese that you've let go too long. Um, yeast is almost kind of like, it's kind of like the spore form of the mold that it can, you know, travel and then it kind of sets up um, a campsite for mold to form. It's kind of the smaller form that can then be exposed. So this is dimorph, meaning that it can grow as either a mold or a yeast. It tends to grow as a mold when it's at like room temperature, cooler temperatures, and as a yeast in the body, so at higher temperatures. Um, so the yeast form is what we're actually going to see in our patients um, and is also the infective state of the organism. That's how you're actually going to be exposed to it in such a way that you might actually develop disease. The yeasts can be found intracellularly in macrophages and other um, phagocytes or extracellularly as well. Um, so you can see here, this arrow here, is actually pointing at a phagocyte. This whole thing is a phagocyte, and over here is like the nucleus of it. And then these little dots here are all little intracellular circular yeast forms. So this phagocyte here is just full of histoplasma yeast, okay? Um, so where do we actually find this? So they've done studies, and you can actually find histoplasma all over the world, every continent except for Antarctica. Um, but there are places where it's actually um, expected to be found, and we're actually kind of one of those places. So it's endemic to the Ohio Mississippi River Valley. That's kind of the key point to know. In fact, um, Indianapolis down here is actually the histo capital of the world, fun fact. But we do actually see a fair amount of histoplasma um, in Illinois and Chicago. So you can see this darker green down here is where it concentrates. But then as you move through Illinois, the entirety of Illinois certainly has a histoplasma risk. At Rush, we see anywhere from five to 10 histoplasma patients per year. Um, so it's not entirely uncommon, although it's not you know, as common as some of the bacterial organisms that we've talked about. Um, when we think about what kind of populations we're dealing with or where we're gonna see it, um, as I mentioned, it's endemic here, but it can spread down. So we will see it, you know, Texas is certainly lit up here. You can actually also find it in like the Caribbean, in Mexico. So it kind of goes all over the place. Um, the populations though, you have to think about how you're actually going to encounter it. So how do you actually become infected is actually exposure to it um, where it thrives. So it thrives in soil, particularly in soil that is enriched with either bird or bat guano. So um, think about like caves, like if you've ever heard of like going spelunking, so cave exploring. Um, bird farmers, we find it associated with like um, chicken coops or um, nesting areas of birds, certainly hunters who um, spend a lot of time in forestry, but basically any of these soils that are enriched in this. And so what happens is you're exploring this cave and you pick it up on your shoes and it becomes aerosol, aer aerosolized and you inhaled it. Um, and that's actually how it kind of takes root. There have been reports of outbreaks in prisons and schoolyards. Um, a couple years ago, actually, Rush investigated an outbreak of Histo at Cook County Jail. Um, they were making some updates to the jail. So there was construction and excavation that was kind of kicking up the soil and about five to six inmates actually developed pulmonary histoplasmosis. So basically anything that aerosolizes it, because what happens is 
the yeast get aerosolized and then you breathe them in and that's how you actually wind up developing disease. So histo is pretty common, um, just kind of where it is, it's endemic, but most people do not get infected. So if you inhale histos, uh, histospores, it's not like you're immediately going to become ill. Um, it's actually estimated that only about one to 5% of people will develop fulminant infection. Um, because what actually happens with histo is that you inhale the spores and the macrophages, the monocytes, the neutrophils, all of those phagocytes are gonna flood the area and they're gonna phagocytose the spores. And then they're gonna take it back to the regional lymph node and kind of keep it in check there. Um, so they'll either keep it in check or they'll eradicate it. Um, and the immune system is actually pretty adept at handling it. Um, some patients though will develop kind of a self-limited flu-like illness, um, you know, fevers, maybe a cough for a couple of days, but they'll get over it, right? Because the immune system is able to take care of it. It's a pretty, um, we're pretty effective at it. Um, but there are individuals that will go on to develop kind of an acute primary pneumonia. Um, like I said, about 50 to 90% of patients are asymptomatic, but the ones who do, they'll develop this pneumonia. And one of the things that's kind of unique about histo that we don't tend to see with some of the other fungal infections I'm gonna talk about in this case, like blasto or coxy, is that you're gonna see enlargement of the mediastinal and hilar lymph nodes. Um, so that kind of is a way of kind of looking at it as a potential clue. If you have somebody with like significant risk factors, then you know that might be something. Um, the individuals who go on to develop pneumonia more often have some sort of um, immunocompromised status. Um, so they're like a transplant patient or they have HIV. Um, you can also see it in patients with like significant lung dysfunction, um, COPD, or patients on glucocorticoids, right? Because glucocorticoids kind of put us in that immunosuppressed um, situation. The other way you could get histoplasmosis is if you are a healthy host but you inhale a huge burden of spores. That's like overwhelming. So like Batman, he spends a lot of time around bats. He is probably at risk for inhaling a huge amount of spores that would then lead him to develop um, acute primary pneumonia. Um, acute primary pneumonia can go on to become a chronic cavitary pneumonia. Um, so this will normally affect like your upper lobes um, we're normally expecting to see this um, in older men, um, COPD patients, emphysema patients, chronic smokers, things like that. What happens is that acute pneumonia kind of cavitates, um, and this and also the acute pneumonia can kind of mimic TB. But the other thing that happens with the cavitary pneumonia is that it actually tends to mimic um, lung cancer on chest x-ray. So typically you're gonna need to do another test to rule out lung cancer, because obviously the treatment would be very different. So those are kind of the pulmonary effects of histoplasmosis. In a very small percentage of patients, we can see kind of an extra pulmonary spread, a disseminated histoplasmosis. Um, we really only see this in patients who are significantly immunocompromised. So um, HIV positive patients who have a CD4 count that's very low, less than 100. Um, and the reason is that you're thinking about patients who have this altered host immunity. So one of the reasons that we only get like asymptomatic or um, an acute but self-limited flu-like illness is that our immune system kind of shows up, it engulfs the pathogen, and it either eradicates it or keeps it in check. In these patients who have um, a, uh, you know, immunosuppression, they're not able to keep up with the burden of the spores. So what happens is they pick it up, they take it back to their local lymph node, and then it's able to spread. And it does kind of have a propensity to spread through the organs of the reticulo and uh, reticulo and reticuloendothelial system, excuse me. So you might see enlarged lymph nodes in distal places, you know, the cervical, the axial, the inguinal. Um, and you can also see splenomegaly um, as it, you know, spreads systemically. Um, and the other place where it can actually go is that it's able to penetrate the bone marrow. And when it penetrates the bone marrow, you might see pancytopenia. Um, and that's obviously bad news, right? Because if it penetrates the bone marrow and causes depletion of cells there, then you lose some of those neutrophils, right? And it's the neutrophils that have a good chance of keeping it in check.
So once you become neutropenic, that's obviously really bad news. Um, it also has the ability to infiltrate the adrenal glands, and that can cause um, patients to present with symptoms of like adrenal insufficiency, and in some cases, even adrenal crisis. So this is a patient with disseminated histoplasmosis. He actually had all of the symptoms I just mentioned, you know, um, several weeks of pneumonia, anorexia, fatigue, fever, et cetera, kind of this nonspecific um, subacute systemic um, illness. And then what they found actually was that the patient was HIV positive and that he had a CD4 T cell count of like 50. Um, and he also had these kind of papules all over, um, particularly on his face, but also um, in other locations. And this, these are actually also a, a further symptom of histoplasmosis that just, he's kind of got this systemic disseminated extra pulmonary spread of the fungal infection. Okay, so how do we diagnose histo? Um, histo can actually be pretty difficult to diagnose. Um, and actually the key to it is kind of just um, keeping it on your differential, thinking of it, and then, you know, seeing if it fits, you know, does your patient meet the right criteria and, you know, what kind of simple uh, symptoms are they showing? Um, so the one way you could do it is certainly by looking for the fungi itself. So um, if you take a sample like lavage fluid or lung biopsy or blood, if it's a disseminated case. And you can look for the small yeast forms like we talked about at the beginning of the video. And it, once again, they can be intracellular or extracellular. But culture is the gold standard. Um, histo can be a little slow to grow out. Um, it can take a, a, a bit of time. Um, here at Rush, we keep our fungal cultures for four weeks. So typically that's enough time for histo to grow out. But that can be a long period of time, especially if you're dealing with a patient who's got like disseminated histoplasma. Um, so there are some non-culture-based methods. Um, there's an antigen detection test for histoplasma that's been developed. Um, so basically what this is, is it's looking for the antigen for a polysaccharide that's found in the cell wall of histo. And that polysaccharide is galactomannan. So if you go back to that intro to mycology um, that's in your self-study, fungi basically have three polysaccharides in their cell walls mannan, glucan, and chitin. And this test actually looks for the breakdown of products of these cell wall polysaccharides, which is galactomannan. And you can actually measure it in the blood or in the urine. Um, so basically as it's broken down, you can find it. Um, it's most useful for patients who have a fulminant infection. So if you're waiting for a culture to grow, this test can get back to you in about a week. We don't do it here, but you can get it back in about a week. And if you have a patient who has an overwhelming infection, so severe diffuse bilateral pneumonia, multi-organ involvement, something like that, they're going to have a high amount of antigen and you have a better chance of getting a positive result. Um, it does cross-react with blasto and coxy, um, but it is, you know, it's still a useful tool. There are also some serology tests. Um, these can be most useful when you're dealing with chronic forms of pulmonary infection, so that chronic cavitating um, pneumonia. So the reason for this is kind of twofold. Um, one, you really in these cases, because the patient is kind of subacute with this chronic pneumonia, they're not likely to have a ton of antigen. So it's more likely that it, that antigen test is going to be negative. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have histo. It just means that you can't detect it. Also, remember, antibodies take a little while to come up, right? So this could be a couple of weeks, especially if antigen is low. But if you can get in a chronic infection, you do this antibody test, the antibodies will eventually keep growing as the histo is more and more available. So then you'll be able to detect the antibody positive, even if the antigen is negative. So this can actually be really helpful in patients who have a chronic pneumonia um, who might not be overly symptomatic, but um, the antibody will be present. Treating histo, there's really only two drugs, um, itraconazole or amphotericin B. Um, and those are pretty much, you know, that's kind of the standard of treatment for treating histo.